I think we are ready. Okay, well, uh, thank you for everyone that is spending their Friday afternoon with us. Um, we've got two fantastic speakers today. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Electra, who is the founder and CEO of the Law Boutique. And I would like to introduce you to Guy, who is the founder and CEO of Legal Connection. I will be talking today about legal design, streamlined communication, and bringing your customer as a collaborator. Um, before I start putting my questions forward, I wish to uh, have both of you introduce yourselves to our audience. So uh, maybe we start with uh, Electra first. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Electra. I'm the founder of The Law Boutique. And The Law Boutique is an alternative legal service provider uh, it was founded in 2017, and we predominantly work with uh, tech companies, lots of fintechs, and we help them with things like legal design, outsourced flexible legal support, and legal operations. Thank you, Electra. Uh, over to you, Guy. Hey, so I'm Guy. I come from a computer science background. I ran a technology company for 10 years before starting Legal Connection. And um, I look at the product from the consumer side, obviously, being not a lawyer. Um, it's a communication and collaboration tool that lawyers can use to chat and work with their clients and also to work with each other. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And very shortly about me, uh, my name is Timo. I run Cosmonauts. I run another company called Pekama. We do all sorts of stuff, uh, but we mainly um, work with companies building uh, their business, predominantly tech companies uh, like Guys One. Uh, and we run a lot of uh, conferences uh, all around the world, uh, not at the minute, as you can imagine. Um, but progressing to the questions, I, I think that I'll ask a very simple question to start with, because I think it's a question that people have very different answers to. Um, and that's, what's legal design? Uh, I think it, it, it means different things for different people. What does it mean to your lecturer? Um, so I think that you're right. There are a lot of misconceptions around what legal design means. Lots of people think that it means just making a document look prettier or making a contract, put emojis in it. But it's it's not necessarily that. It's uh, about taking a document, a process, anything really, and looking at the way looking at the way that it's structured and envisaging how how the user would want to consume that. So taking a user centric approach to whatever it is that you're designing. So let's take a contract, for example. If you look at a contract today, a typical contract looks pretty ugly, uh, not really user-friendly, not easy on the eye, lots of text, lots of blocks, not really visual. And, and that makes it a document that's not very popular. So you talk about contracts, people don't love them. I think one of the reasons is the fact that they've not been designed with the user in mind. And, and, and just on that point, the user isn't necessarily always another lawyer. The user is, is a business if it's a business contract. So if you're if you're a CFO or if you're a tech person, you don't want to be loads of legalese. You want to understand what your obligations are in an easily consumable way. So legal design is taking that approach, the approach of what does the user want to see whilst designing things like documents and processes. I, I, I think that you, you, you're touching on something very topical, actually. I think that everyone... Uh, that perhaps is not very legally or oriented, uh, really is dreading reading contracts. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my business, uh, that was something that would take me ages. Uh, not because I don't want to advance on certain action, it's just because I just couldn't be bothered to do it. I mean, you know, I'm fortunate enough now to have uh, people doing that for me, and all I need to do is ask them, well, is there anything that I should be concerned of? And as you trust that person and they tell you no, that's about good enough for me, I'll put that signature. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that on camera, but still. Uh, but I, I think that a lot of people, um, I mean, you know, uh, just don't do it. Um, a lot of non-lawyer people. But over to you guys. So what, what is legal design to you? Okay, well, I'm gonna say something kind of different. And I've been listening to a few podcasts about legal design and also been thinking about design thinking as well. Um, so in Joburg, uh, where I come from, the five most beautiful buildings in the center of the city are actually the five biggest law firms, the Our Magic Circle. And not only are they beautiful from the outside, but when you walk in, you come into this cavernous hall with this um, sort of reception at the front, and then you sent up an elevator into a beautiful boardroom. And 
So, you know, that's something that everyone, that is design thinking, you know, that's, that's uh, sort of creating an experience for your user. Um, and that's something that we can all relate to, you know, whether you come from a technology uh, um, standpoint or not. Um, and now sort of as we transition to tech and tech becomes the first experience that most um, of your clients will have with you as a law firm, you know, whether that tech is sending emails backwards and forwards, or as you say, setting up uh, contracts, documents, um, et cetera, it's, it's about taking that, that experience, the same experience that you felt at the law firm when you got to the beautiful boardroom with the nice cappuccino, and it's sort of bringing that into everything that, that happens in the um, experience. You know, that's, that's something off the top of my head. I don't know whether it's going to be a dictionary definition, but that's something. But are we, are we actually able to, to borrow some, some techniques from, from tech, really? Because, I mean, frankly, I think that a lot of tech companies haven't got that right themselves. Uh, I mean, like we see a lot of products that uh, are frankly shit products from a user perspective. So, you know, uh, should we like think in a totally different way when we're talking about legal design or should we be borrowing stuff from industries that have established design as a thing in a way, if you wish? Who, who, I guess it depends who you ask. If, if you ask me, we should borrow everything from, from tech. I think all the, the tech companies, every everything that's doing well you know you name it netflix um uh, apple every single tech company has got a huge design component at the center and, and you can almost nail their success down to their design and i think that that's why the legal profession is now starting to look to design thinking what do you think electra well i i if you take an example that happened to me the other day i was trying to book a fitness class and the uh user journey to book this fit, fitness class was so onerous and had to answer all these questions about my health and I was like oh, for god's sake it's a 45 minute class it's not worth my time to do this I just gave up obviously I wasn't that motivated to do this class but I did just give up and the reason was that it was just such an onerous process that I didn't want to engage and that's a human a human response to something that's difficult or confusing and so with law it's inherently difficult and confusing so if you're trying to simplify what you're doing and your product which is a contract or a process or whatever then you should be thinking of the user um, if you really care about the user because you can draft a contract you know by a lawyer for a lawyer but ultimately and i've had this when i worked in huge corporations before where i spent about four months negotiating this contract and like 1 a.m in the morning it was horrible and then i came out of this negotiation with this contract that the the lawyers that we we had gone to external lawyers to support us with this and they thought they'd done a great job which they probably had from a you know letter of the law perspective but i came out of this negotiation and i tried to roll out the obligations in the contract to the team and they all looked at me and they were like we don't understand what this contract really says you're going to need to translate it so i spent another four months redesigning this contract uh, and, and putting it into visual form and creating tools and we built a bit of tech to facilitate some of the processes that the contract envisaged and, and, and it all boils down to yeah you know on the one hand as the lawyer you really want to make sure that your contract's watertight but on the other hand you have uh, you do have an obligation in a way to make sure that whatever it is that you design is usable and not just something to, to you, it's not just an insurance policy. A contract is more than just that. So, um, yeah. But shouldn't we be really redesigning and simplifying things across the board? Uh, I mean, when I, when I hear the, you know, when I hear the, the phrase uh, by a lawyer for a, for a lawyer, I, I'm kind of getting like almost night sweats, I swear. Uh, I, I mean, if we're able to simplify it for our customers, why not simplify it across the board? Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, what, what's your what's your opinion on, on that? Uh, is, is that happening? Is it just purely done on the customer front or, or should it be done on overall across the sector? I, I think it should be done overall across the sector, because even as a lawyer, if I pick up a contract to review and it's really heavy and confusing and the language is horrible and I... I just don't want to read it. I, 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 I will understand it, but it makes me feel like there's a lack of transparency there. Whereas if you pick up a contract now and you look at tech businesses and they're, they're really leading by example, I'd say, because they're, they, they are, even if they're not consumer facing businesses, they're thinking of the reader and, you know, lawyers are humans too, even though uh, some people might not believe it. And they don't want to see a contract that's really heavy and, 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 and stressful to look at. Um, 
even talking about the operational side of this and the cost benefit to implementing legal design into, into the way that you draft your contracts and products, it will take you less time to negotiate a contract that's not riddled with complex legalese, whether it's by lawyers for lawyers or whether it's by lawyers for a business or for a consumer. Um, uh, Electra, can I, can I ask you something? Um, so this whole concept of legal design, and, and especially as you start to design out these contracts, are you not uh, maybe taking on a little bit too much of the responsibility then in, in terms of saying, look, I, I know what you want. I know what I think you want. I'm going to design this that you can then consume, you know? Um, and, you know, I, again, I draw from my own experience. Um, having I, I used to build software. I used to design websites for a living, you know? And that, that whole concept of designing websites is now sort of gone um, because now what you do is you co-create and your your client kind of holds your hand and, and, and you work together. And I sometimes, I'm not uh, saying that you do this, but I sometimes see that what, what the legal profession sees as legal design is sort of sitting um, in a workshop with post-it notes and, uh, you know, sort of putting together this, what's going to be a magic black box that... Uh, that then the client will interact with and the lawyer can step away. Do you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. You need to do user research and you need to agree. I agree. I mean, design thinking principles and, and taking a design thinking approach to things, uh, a huge part of that is listening, taking feedback um, and, and, and co-creating. And then after you've done something, iterating. So um, we build lots of ops. Um, for our clients, which means that we basically go in and look at the way they have contracts submitted to them by the rest of their business, because we work predominantly with in-house lawyers. Uh, and and, and we, we build something for them. And most times within three months, we will change that system or we'll redesign it because we're constantly listening to feedback. So uh, but that's a really good point. And I think that comes back to lawyers not really being comfortable with vulnerability, which is probably a completely different topic. But um, because of the way that we're trained and the way that uh, there's there's an expectation on the profession, I think it is harder sometimes for a lawyer to say, "Tell me what, tell me what you need," or, you know, "I don't really know what I'm doing here. Can you can you give me your input?" And because of that, it can be quite difficult to co-create, which is why perhaps you've seen that happen. Um, but it's not always the lawyer's fault. It's just so, um, are you guys we've, noticing that there's people so we've got the first, uh, we've got our first um, poll out. Uh, so we're asking our audience what what do they feel legal design is. So that will be running for the next five minutes or so. Uh, in the in the meantime, I'm going to move to our next question, um, which is touching on uh, streamlined communication. So how can how can we streamline uh, our communication with people? And I think that the question really will be going. Uh, around streamlining things internally and externally. Um, so uh, over to you, Guy. I know that you built a fantastic platform, uh, and I'm not just saying that because we work together. Um, so can you tell us, in, in your view, um, what, what makes a, a communication easy enough, prompt enough, and candid enough uh, for, for people? Yeah, look, so, you know, you know my story. I uh, went to a law firm. I struggled to communicate with them. I um, and based on my frustrations, I, I went and built Legal Connection. I dreamed or imagined that I would be in a WhatsApp group. All the lawyers would be in with me and we would all be sharing and working together. Um, and, didn't, and because that experience didn't present itself, um, I went and created what was essentially the WhatsApp of law. Um, and so for me, uh, really communication and, and streamlined communication in 2020 is super asynchronous. We're having a live discussion right now uh, uh, on a webinar, but 90% or 99% of the communication that I do is in chat. Um, and so borrowing from you know what, what experience uh, we have in Slack, in WhatsApp, in all of these channels, um, and I, that's what I created. It, was, it wasn't something that, that was easy and that is necessarily easy to sell to the law firms. In the beginning, they looked at me like I was crazy and they said, why would we want to have our clients in a WhatsApp chat? My client's going to interrupt me the whole time. I don't, I'm not going to know who to bill. But I think that um, even in even the last two years, that sentiment has changed in, enormously as uh, lawyers have realized that you, you've got to meet your clients, you know, really live and in the moment and, and got to hold, handhold them through. Otherwise, you'll they'll essentially just drop off. 
But, uh, interesting enough, things that we, we've become accustomed in our personal lives and things that have become a daily routine sometimes are difficult to translate in our professional life. Um, yeah. I'm not, not quite sure why, why, why that happens. Whether, whether you, you don't want to be the first one to bring something like that, uh, like this in, you don't want to uh, take, take the risk initially, or um, maybe because we, we don't treat our, our customers as, as our collaborators, and we just purely treat them as customers, uh, maybe. Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't deny having conversations with people from your team uh, consistently. You know, there's some fantastic platforms out there, such as Slack, that we, we all use. Uh, you know, Teams or Microsoft, you know, we, we use all of this internally, yeah. but, but we shy away well, I'm, often I'm doing them externally. I'm interested to see what Electra does, because in a way, uh, and I've been to her talk, so I know this, um, she's embedding herself more in the companies and using the products that, that they use. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the way that we work, I think, is is quite unique. And one of the reasons other law firms don't want to work in this way is exactly what you just said, Guy. It is really difficult to know how to bill and, and, and where how to do it. But um, you get used to it and you can find mechanisms whereby you say, right, I'm going to start the clock now if you're billing hourly. I'm going to start the clock now and I'm going to work on this client. So the way that we work is that because we work with tech companies, they all use Slack. They also all use Jira. They all use Zendesk. So they've got ticketing systems. And what we've done is we've built help desks for all of our clients on the system that they use as a ticketing desk for things like IT queries. And we use that as a legal help desk. I think lots of tech companies are doing that already for their legal team. So if anyone has a query, they can submit that through Jira. We then integrate Jira with one of our, with, with our internal system, which then brings all the, the various client queries that we have into our internal system. And then we choose when to work on what, and then we start billing on that matter. Uh, and and can I ask you a question, Electra, since I've got you? Um, a lot of lawyers say, ask me, they say, okay, this chat looks weird. I don't know if I feel comfortable giving legal advice in chat format. I'm so used to writing an email. I don't feel comfortable writing, yes, this looks good, or no, this doesn't. And, you know, where do you, do you come up against that at all? Or is that, is that a cultural think. thing? Why don't they feel comfortable? I'm not. That's, that's a good. They say I don't. I I want to take my time and write an email. I don't feel comfortable write, um, writing something in a Slack. And then what I've written is going to be against my name forever. So maybe there's a there's a feeling that once they write something, it's a uh, in permanent ink. Um, it's it's something I hear often when they, when people look at our user experience because it's so different to what they're used to, which is a back and forth email correspondence. Yes. I get that. And, and the, the other thing that we do is that uh, apart from the Jira and the fact that you have tickets, which actually gives you the time to triage the work and say, right, this is urgent. This is not urgent. And I'm going to work on this and I'm going to sit and draft a response, which makes me really comfortable as a lawyer because I get I get what you're saying. Um, and then you also have Slack and Slack's dangerous, I think, in a way, if you're not if you're not mindful, because Slack is a it's like a, um, a, a, con a conscious stream of thought. Um, and then you just write and you're like, oh, you're not advising in the traditional sense that lawyers are used to doing. You're just yeah. chat. And then within that chat, you might give some guidance. And so I might construe that as advice. But I think that a lot of the way that we work, and I think this is kind of akin to the agile way of working, because before in IT projects, you had waterfall and it was quite easy to work in a specific way because you knew, you know, you know, around this contract, this is what we're delivering. And. Whereas with Agile, you can't really commit. You kind of have to go with it and see what happens and then agree that this is actually the scope that we're delivering. It's kind of the same with the way that we work. We, we do work in an Agile form. So we have an understanding with our clients that, you, you know, this at this point in time, we are behaving as though we are in-house counsel. So we right. have a conversation to iterate and understand. And then when we get to a conclusion, then we can write you that long email. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. It does to me. <laughs> so um, while you guys were, 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 were talking, I just um, put forward the next question uh, to our audience. How would you like to work? Uh, we've got only three possible answers here. Um, and one seems to be waiting over the others, which is working a perfect collaboration with the client sharing tasks. Uh, and again, I I'll, I'll pass over that to you. Uh, Electric, how, how did you kind of navigate yourself around this concept? I mean, your, your story is very interesting. I know you were in-house counsel for 
quite some time um, before before uh, founding um, the Law Boutique. Uh, how did you arrive at the conclusion that things fundamentally uh, could work better? Well, I think it was several things. I, can I just say that I didn't really plan for my business to be the way it is. It happened by osmosis. It kind of happened because it felt natural. And while I was while I was delving into this new business, it it kind of just yeah, it just evolved in this way. I saw the need and I saw what my clients wanted and we just started to work in the way that they wanted rather than try to impose the way that we wanted to work. I think it helps that I didn't work in a law firm for very, very long. I was always in-house. Um, so uh, I think one of the main reasons I'm happy to work so iteratively and in such an agile way is because I started off my career at the European Space Agency where I worked with lots of rocket scientists and they are very specific in the way that they want to work and the specifications that they put out are very, you know, um, well, it's, it's rocket science, if you know what I mean. It has to be a specific way and the risks are really high and they're building a satellite and the project's going to take 10 years to deliver. So I had to adapt to the way that they worked. I couldn't take my own preferred way of working or more risk diverse way of working into those meetings with them or into those interactions. So I, um, from a very early um, time in my career, I became kind of very adaptable to the different styles, particularly within tech. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the best way to get the most out of a lawyer client relationship is to work collaboratively like a team. And I think as, a, as lawyers, we, we've got it hard, don't mean to, you know, pull the victim heart card here at all, but we do have it hard because there's this there's this uh, pressure that you, if you get it wrong, um, you know, you could get sued and it will be a huge, a huge deal. And, you know, you, you could get it wrong for your client and then the stakes there are very high. And sometimes that stops us from being able to collaborate. And I don't know what the solution is there. You're either a more risk averse lawyer that says I'm never going to take this agile approach or you're more open to risk and you you can take this approach because of, because of the career that you've had or your your personality do you know what i mean so i i, I guess that maybe but the balance is somewhere somewhere in between uh, I, I i that's something very interesting uh i mean it's interesting what you're saying what i was thinking just just now is whether there will be a, a comparison between uh, legal professionals having started their career in law firms and legal professionals that have started their career in corporate and and to see whether the professional the legal professionals that have originated from corporate are, are slightly more entrepreneurial because really when you're working in a in an organization which is which is a business as opposed to law firm perhaps you are borrowing from the notions from from the practices from the culture uh and you know frankly you know most businesses are not really risk averse you know like we we, we all run businesses we know that if we want to win we've got to take risks mm. um so yep. I don't know whether there's a study out there. If there isn't, someone should do it. Maybe we'll do it. We'll see. Uh, what, what, what do you think, Guy? Um, what, what do you think about streamlining the communication? How, how can, can we do it both internally and externally and perhaps combine the two? Is it purely through tech? Is it, is it more than, than tech? Yeah, look, I think tech plays a huge role. Um, and again, this is something I chatted to you about yesterday. The, uh, when I started to being an, a web designer, uh, I knew HTML. They didn't know HTML. I could do something they couldn't do. And so I always had work. And then these products like um, uh, Wix and Squarespace came out and, and uh, started to do, people wanted to do it themselves. Um, and at first it frustrated me. And then one day a client said to me, I want to build my website in Wix. I said, okay, cool. Why are you talking to me? And he said, well, I want you to build it in Wix with me um, together. And, and I thought that that was super confusing. Like, why would he want to use a DIY program where he doesn't need me, but then still have me there? Um, and he, it was a frustrating client. Uh, I'm not going to lie, but I sat there and I co-created this website with him and I took all his, what he wanted to do and he took my um, uh, sort of technical experience and I took what he knew about his company and we did it together and, and he continues to call me back. He was on a boat because um, it was a, that was the business. Um, so I'd have to go to the boat and, and sit and work with him on the boat. And yeah, we built this beautiful website together and that was a, a turning point in my career. Um, I changed the way I worked after that. After that, I was like, okay, cool. This is how we're going to work open cards you're going to see exactly what tech i use 
uh, you, since you're paying for my time, you can have as much, uh, you can have me there in the moment. Uh, and that was the, the sort of ending of the back and forth emails. Um, and again, yeah, I think it translates beautifully into, into legal and into legal design. I think that a lot of um, clients are approaching a lawyer and saying, okay, cool, I'm, I'm choosing between you and going to Google. Um, I'm choosing between you and going to seed legals, whatever it is. Um, and if I, I, I want to sit and work with you on the best tech that exists, I want to see the tools that you're using, I want to learn with you as we go along, um, and I want to have a hand in it. And, and I think that that's, that's a trend. I've, I've had you know, um, lawyers approach me and say, look, um, how can I how can, I mean, use Seed Legals as an example? How can I compete with someone like Seed Legals? They're, you know, they've got this huge uh, DIY interface system where the client can do everything for themselves and the lawyers are kind of um, a little bit left out of, that, out of the mix. Um, and so, you know, in order to bring themselves back, they've got to be super interactive. And, and what we're looking at is using Google Docs, uh, using collaborative work, working products, um, setting up, uh, you know, as like Electra, the Jiras and these task management tools, and uh, really letting the lawyer and the client have as much sort of um, face time as possible um, in the virtual space. Um, uh I mean, this is, this is something that shouldn't be considered just by big firms, really. I think that it's something that certainly uh, applies uh, to firms regardless uh, of, of their size. And I think that um, when, when it comes to adoption of, of innovation, there shouldn't be an organization too big or too small to, to, to start. Uh, I know that when, when, when you were uh, building your product, guy, you know, we start, you started with the thought for smaller uh, companies, you know that yeah, that, that I'm, are I'm growing. A comment here from Gautier about um, about the experience that he had with big firms and, and small firms, um, and for sure, big big firms sometimes have an advantage of having all this extra tech on their side, whereas small firms, I think, sometimes have the advantage that their client has a limited budget, and that that actually can be an advantage because it forces them to get creative and, and say, look, instead of taking ten hours, I need to do this in one hour, and since I need to do it in one hour. We, we need to come together um, on this. Um, and and uh, risk aside, the millennial client wants to do a lot themselves. And, and so the, you know, Electra knows, knows this and she just sort of brought it up. It's, you know, it's about mitigating the risk, but then also understanding that the customer wants to do it themselves. And the customer wanting to do it themselves is fantastic. If you can get your customer to do nine hours out of your 10 hour job, you're winning in life. You know what I mean? I, I I know, guy. I know. And and prior to your previous note, I wish I was on a boat right now rather than stuck in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, be, we'll be moving to to uh, our last question, and and I know that you both have different perspectives on on that question. Um, and it's a question around uh, around the customer. Mm -hmm. Should we be adjusting to the customer's way of doing things? Should we be joining the customer's team? Or should we be bringing our customer in our team? And should we be introducing them to the way that we do things? Yeah. So uh, I, I will address the question to you first, Electra, because I, I, I really like your business model, actually. Um, I, I think that it's a fantastic model. Uh, I think that you've also um, Put forward some some very clever ways of uh, of, of a model that uh, can be scaled up because sometimes with a lot of fantastic models which are customer centric, uh, OFO uh, op, op, sees struggles in scalability. But I don't think that will be the case um, with, with you guys. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So I actually th I actually do worry about scalability sometimes because the um, the, the service that we offer is very bespoke. So I'll just I'll talk you through the process um, just so just so I can give some context. So the way that we operate is that we'll engage a GC usually or a senior in-house counsel, and uh, they'll say, right, guys, we need some help with either data protection work, which is quite high volume, um, and or commercial contract review, negotiations, stuff like that. So we'll say, fine, we need to embed ourselves as members of your team because that's how we work. Uh, we don't work on an instruction basis. So there is no lengthy instruction process. And the reason we do that is because we found that 
Um, one of the barriers to uh, legal support from in-house counsel or that in-house counsel you've expressed to us is the lengthy instruction process. And again, just going back, I saw one of the comments um, saying that sometimes law firms have quite a low risk appetite. Um, yeah, I get that. It is a regulated profession, so, you know, that's, that's what comes with it, unfortunately. Um, but we found that that constant having to sit down and write a, a long instruction made in-house counsel say, oh, well, do you know, I haven't got time to do that. By the time I do that, get quotes in and choose someone, I may as well just do it myself or with my team. So we decided to remove that barrier by embedding ourselves as part of the team. So there's a bit of an integration piece there where we get an email address to the business, we get onto their Slack, we get onto their Jira, et cetera. So once we become once we become part of their team, we start looking at the way that they operate. So we look at the way that they, um, they take contracts, for example. So accepting to review a contract via Slack is not a great idea because first of all, you're sharing information on Slack then you can't get any data out of it. So at the moment, the way that we operate means that we can also give data insights. So for example, this month, we've reviewed 20 NDAs. And actually, because now your whole team is using this, I can tell you that your team reviewed 50 NDAs. Why on earth are you reviewing 50 NDAs? Maybe we should look at your NDA template and put some legal design into it. Because that's not a word that is, Electra, how are you, if every company you work on is working on a different platform, how are you going to scale uh, that exactly. kind of practice? exactly my, my my worry so what we've now done is first of all made a decision that as soon as you onboard a client there needs to be an integration piece whereby we have to with apis push stuff to our own internal system and now that's working quite well so i think what we did before is kind of you know you just you just get into the work you don't realize that there's an integration element there that needs to happen in order for it to work seamlessly and in order for you to process the work so that's what we're doing. Another thing that we're doing to, to help us um, become a bit more scalable is when we're responding to a question, we save that answer that we've given that could be applied across industries. And we're trying to build a bit of a, a bit of a knowledge base so our clients can use that to self-serve as much as possible. So we're I trying like to make ourselves we're trying to make legal as scalable as possible and as self-serve as possible always knowing that law isn't entirely DIY, never will be. So, yeah. I, I like it. I think if there's one thing that's in common between uh, myself, Electra and Timo, it's that we all want to be uh, very successful and very rich and uh, build huge companies. And uh, if I, I, to, I don't want to be rich, rich guy. I want to go yeah. to Mars, but that's a different story. Yeah, <laughs> you want to go to Mars. Um, I want to get on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know about Electra, but yeah, you, you've got to you've got to be able to scale the business. And if you scale the business, you you can't be um, constantly. You've, you've got to find things that, that happen over and over again. You can't be um, embedding yourself in everyone else's tech. If you look at something like Airbnb, you know they didn't they didn't go and uh, and create a plugin for every um, you know for every different what do you call it um, hotel and booking system and everything like that they, they created a unified experience yeah um, and that's what we're all gonna sort of uh, figure out as we right. as we grow mm -hmm. I, I mean i mean like really like if you cannot scale a business you don't really have a business you have a job mm. so the, 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 the two are career, fundamentally yeah. different yeah so He's got there are many people uh, uh, in the world who do things which don't scale because that that's the only way that we can do the things which do scale. The the thing is, that I think that there there is a potential for scalability almost in any any path of work. I th I think there are variables that you need to indicate whether uh, you know and and they're and they're both technical, uh, operational, but also emotional variables. You, mm -hmm. you know, being able to scale a business is is having the ability to give up on control. Uh, and trusting people around you, because uh, you know you, you you cannot look after everything. Being being able to replicate at a larger scale what you already know. So yeah. uh, you know you you can be a very talented professional in the field that 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 you cover, uh, but that doesn't make you a good business person. Mm. So um, and I I highly respect uh, those people, but it, it's a, it's a different uh, type of conversation uh that 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 we're that we're having here in comparison to a lifestyle business uh, as, as I many people you've, call it. Uh, you've, you've put up a new poll um i had put up a new poll polls have been going strong by the way uh, just so you're aware to our entire audience we'll be sharing the results of those polls with everyone we're not just collecting them for ourselves uh, sharing is caring can, uh, we're can also the going to be results? 
because I can see it, but I don't want to say anything. <laughs> um, we, we'll be putting we'll putting the results together and sending them out to everyone. Everyone is going to also receive a recording of this, uh, not just the presenters. Um, so, guy, I mean, is 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 tech in the center of uh, bringing your customers? Um, in, in, in your team? Should we be bringing customers in our team? Should we be joining our customers' teams? I, I know that you're more of an advocate of uh, essentially having people um, joining the way of, uh, of, of work of, of, of the lawyer as opposed to the other look, way around. Look, I think um, myself and Electra might come at it from different perspective in the terms of Electra deals with tech companies and they've each got their system and these tech companies like that's a religion for them you know whether it's jira or asana or Basecamp, is like asking someone uh christianity or judaism or apple or uh android <laughs> you know it's a very personal choice um but i think um in the in the space that i play in a little bit more we're often coming to fill a void which doesn't exist you know so we're often what we're replacing is nothing um, and it, it makes my life a little bit easier because then I can start with a blank slate. And so Legal Connection was created with this idea of, um, of helping helping people that want to scale their operations and that move fast um, and really just uh, give, give the high touch experience to the client um, and work in that very futuristic way that we've that we've been talking about, where the clients and the lawyer are collaborators and, and work together. Yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um, it's it, 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 good enough of an answer for me, so I, 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 <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll take that. Um, we have a few, we have a few questions from from the audience, um, and I will start with uh, Zain Hock, who's got a question around privacy. Uh, how important is privacy in uh, legal tech? Um, I would address that to, to both of you, actually, um, uh, as, as a user on the Electra side and, and as a creator on, on Guy's side. Um, can you tell us more about that? Um, privacy, are we talking about data protection law? Are we talking We're talking about, about legal tech. I don't know. Zayn hasn't really um, specified. Uh, maybe you take the angle you wish it, uh, you think it's uh, the right angle. Yeah, I mean, obviously, data protection is important in legal tech. Um, privacy generally. I think another thing that we need to consider is legal privilege. So um, I actually had this conversation with the Law Society a couple of months ago and I asked them whether uh, if I if I had a tool uh, whereby I was advising clients in a chat form and the terms and conditions of that tool said that anyone can access it to men maintain it etc would that erode legal privilege and there wasn't really an answer because i don't think that's been considered yet and we're still we're still going um th through the courts with questions around well if someone emails you and you've cc'd someone does that erode legal privilege so there's a lot of conversation go going on there uh, so yeah privacy is important if you are building legal tech you do need to consider what your terms say and what your what what kind of access you're allowing to um to legal advice uh, because you don't want to erode legal privilege if you're a legal tech company so just something to consider yeah i think um one thing i noticed when i got into the space when i spoke to the biggest players you know for baker mckenzie as an example you know they use nothing which isn't built in-house by themselves in which they control every single component of it so they will not use dropbox they will not use uh, WhatsApp. And, you know, we all know that WhatsApp is pretty secure, you know, end-to-end -end encryption and so on. Um, but when you, when you come into the space of legal tech, you are up against this question from the very get-go. Um, and the, the kind of tools that we are all talking about, these collaborative tools, they, they rely on a, on a very different data model. Um, yeah, Electra and I discussed this yesterday because I said, how do you get around this question, Electra? And she said it's, it's not a concern in her profession because she just plugs into the system that exists there. She has an email address. She's under their, their banner, you know, where, whereas for a lot of us um, vendors, this is the very first thing we get asked. Where's, where's the data sitting? Who controls it? Um, you know, if I'm on a network with me and the client, where's their client? Where's their data sitting? Where's my data sitting? You know, what are the what are the data residency, GPR, and and so on. Um, so I think it is top of mind. I think that a lot of people though make the mistake um, of thinking that legal data 
or legal content is sort of um, radioactive and can't be held in certain places and that like certain kinds of technology need to be there for that uh, you know for that data to be held and, and therefore that's a, a server in the corner of the office of the law firm and that's obviously not the case some of the best tools in the world uh, you know in this uh, workflow space are, are are some of the most secure tools and something like email is actually the least secure tool so it's it really comes down to how you use the tech rather than what the tech is mm. okay well um i've got a question for me here actually by uh, robert lancaster good to hear from you robert a uh, long time no speak uh, He's asking whether I think rebranding of something that has been around for a long time is important, positive, uh, user-centric design and process improvement having been around for decades. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's positive in case something hasn't been doing particularly well in, 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 in that field. I mean, rebranding won't solve your problems uh, on its own. What I have experienced in my uh, modest career of commercialization of technology in the last four years is that there are lots of great tools out there that remain unnoticed. Uh, having a great tool on its own means absolutely nothing. This is just stage one of your development. Uh, you know, you really have to think about how you're going to market this. You really have to think about how you're going to retain your customers. You know, those are stage two and, and, and three. And, and, you know, frankly, they're probably even more important than how good your tool is. You know, we have fantastic examples out there, a very average tool with, with a massive market penetration. Um, and, and, I, I, and I often use the DocuSign example, you know, an, a, a very average tool uh, that has become a household brand. You know, I've seen another 25 uh, way better um, e-signature platforms out there uh, that just couldn't make it. So I think that it's a common misconception that if you build something fantastic, everyone is just going to come buy, buy it and, and use it. Um, no, that, that, that won't happen. That will happen in an ideal world, not in our world. You know, we, we live in, in, in... So, you know, behind every successful business, you, you, have, a, you have a good product, but not be, behind every good product, you've got a successful business. So that's, that, that's unfortunately where, where, where we are. So you definitely, if you need, you've got to rebrand, but rebranding on its own won't, won't, won't solve any issues. Um, we've got one more uh, question from Nicola Jones to, to you guys. What are the top three behaviors which in your experience help adoption of legal design thinking? Good question. I, I think there's there's only one that, that, that jumps to my mind and that's speak to your clients and look through their eyes. You know, um, Ask your client, you know, what what was it like uh, from the moment we started to the, to the, to the end? Where did you expect things to go differently, and how could they have, have been different? Um, and if you're not if you're not doing that, you're not engaging design thinking at all. Uh, I and and that's certainly how something that that you just need to keep coming back to again and again. It's not something you do once and then design an entire system around. Legal uh, legal design thinking is about constantly evolving and constantly moving. Um, you know, and looking at yourself from the outside, really, design thinking is about putting putting a process in place that that um, that makes sense um, to the people that are interfacing with that system. So continuously stepping up outside yourself and, and looking into your organization. I've heard of I've heard of law firms um, in the states that actually uh, hire companies to call their firm just to see how they answer the phone and just to see how they deal with with the customers and and the results can be quite shocking, uh, actually. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the, those same law firms could have done it themselves. They could have phoned their front desk. They could have pretended to be a client. Really getting into your client's head, that's legal design. Um, I, I, I just want to say something on that. I think if you're trying to get your business to implement legal design thinking into the way that they work, I think the first thing is to try and get them to realize that um, other people see their product or service very differently to the way that they see it. So getting them in front of the of their of their internal clients or their external clients and uh, and getting input from them as to how they view what they're doing. So as an example, before we do a legal design workshop, um, we we will first get input from other stakeholders in the business 
before we go to the legal team and give them that workshop and say, guys, by the way, this is what people think about your privacy policy. This is what people think about the way that you um, you take on contracts to review. Uh, and they're like, wow, I didn't realize that they had a problem with the fact that that tick box was there and not there. It's simple things like that, that people don't really realize. And you don't realize it because you've designed it, so you're not in it. So if you put what you designed out and you get input and feedback, then that gives you a different perspective. So I think trying to change the perspective of the team that you're trying to influence um, into taking on design thinking is, is probably the best, well, the, the behavior that you'd want to encourage. Er erasing, erasing the notion of we've always, always done it this way. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, um, we've got one last question uh, before we before we uh, finalize, uh, and it's a question from Adele Sheik, Sheik to to you, Electra. Uh, how do you feel attitudes have changed in respect to legal design, legal innovation over the years, and why do you think that has happened? Are clients just looking for another competitive edge? Um. Yeah, really good question. So I think, first of all, they're bang on trend, aren't they? Uh, innovation and legal design, and, and uh, they're quite trendy. And the reason they're trendy is, I think, the fact that although many other businesses have progressed in the way that they work and look and feel and in the way that they are user-centric and people feel like they can relate to these businesses, services and products, legal has lagged. Uh, and, 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 and this is not lawyer bashing in any way. Legal has lagged for a lot of good reasons, one of them being that it's a heavily regulated profession. The other is that it is quite archaic uh, because of the, the partnership model. So anyway, I have loads of theories around that. Uh, but I think slowly people are thinking, well, actually, I don't want to do it like this. Why is it that everything else is so much easier to consume and legal just sits in, in, its, in its ivory tower? I don't want that. And lawyers, I think also, as you know, millennial lawyers are now becoming GCs, they're looking at the way that things were working previously and they, and they think, well, why are we doing it like this? And I think, Timo, you touched upon it previously when you said that um, people don't really bring in the way that they operate in their personal lives into, the, into their business lives. And I think there's more of a merging now, isn't there? We mean bringing mm -hmm. more of self to work and, and wanting to bring the ways that you work into in your personal life into your business life so i think the reason is that there's just been more awareness around it uh, i think it's client driven i think it's actually also lawyer driven so um that's why i think it's happening it is very ripe for disruption the legal industry because it is so archaic yeah and one final question because i do not wish to ignore any question and and that will be really the final one so uh, please don't put any other forward how uh, do you get feedback from your users? And I would also assume that users would apply to you, uh, Electra, as, as it is to Guy. So, mm -hmm. Guy, over to you yeah. first. Yeah, users, our users are everything, you know, um, and especially because um, as a startup, um, our users are our success. Um, in real terms, I make friends with them. I chat to them constantly, um, not just about work. Um, I, this is going to sound really funny. My accelerator said to me, how are, you, um, how are you engaging users? And I said, well, I send them pictures of my food. And then they, they looked at me like I was nuts. Um, but but it's, there's something to that. You've got you to make friends with your users. You've got to chat to them, not just in terms of like a poll, like, can I please have five minutes of your time to ask you how you're enjoying the product? You got to you got to really get in there, understand them, get in their head, uh, be speaking to them at nine p.m. at night about um, you know their hopes and dreams, um, and that's yeah, that's worked for me. Um, and I I know that that doesn't scale, um, but as the CEO of the company, speaking to our users all the time and, and being friends with them and uh, bringing them along in the journey is is hugely important. What 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 about you, lecturer? Um, I think feedback is really important, not, in, not just for um, developing your product and making it better, but for you also as the person that's designing it or that's thinking of moving in a certain way. So what we do is we always have a, a ready to go type form survey after every training we give, after every workshop we give, it's just always ready to go. And we also have um, bi-weekly or weekly one-to-ones with our main stakeholders in each business and we just ask them straight up for feedback what can we be doing better because you have that open uh, relationship and that kind of conversation going that's when you get the real feedback 
Um, so I think it's it's a bit of both doing it immediately after a service has been received to get the immediate response and also making sure that you're keeping the dialogue going with your client. I, I, I also think it's about uh, having the guts to swallow criticism and make something out of it. Um, yeah. Asking for a... Asking, asking uh, our, for uh, one of our clients stopped using the product. I'm like, what's going And then she told me we're using monday.com. And I was like, I was like... <laughs> okay, um, this is a bitter pill to swallow, but yeah, what does Monday.com have that we don't? And then, you know, that you, and like, do, do you mind um, doing a screen share with me and taking me through how you use the product? That's, that's hugely valuable. Um, yeah, yeah to, and, okay. and, uh, and taking the criticism and being, being open to it. Well, let's see the product. Open to it. Well, let's see the product then. Show it, show it to us. <laughs> It'll, uh, I could load Monday. I, 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 I hate people talking about products and not showing them. So that, that's okay. another thing. I think that people uh, people do wrong in, in the in the field of uh, tech and legal tech. You know, everyone talks about products, but everyone shies away from uh, from showing them. Actually, cool. So uh, this is what uh, most people see when they come to LegalConnection.co, and then when you jump into the product, it looks a bit like this. Uh, I need to just log out and log in with my test account which uh, is set up by my one of my amazing interns Zaim here we go okay so what you see in legal connection is um, on the left all the matters that you're working on and on the right a conversation relating to that matter so remember we were talking about uh, legal connection being the whatsapp of law this is really um, how it looks uh, in this particular case, okay, cool, this is the client, and here is Saeem, he's the lawyer, um, and here's another lawyer, and if you follow the chat, which we obviously don't have time for, you'll see that um, uh, Saeem may have uh, start, it started the case, and he may have brought in his colleague, and then I think they brought in someone from another firm. Oh, this is a paralegal that, that, um, that got brought in. Then next to the chat is files. Every matter has its own uh, um, files tab, pretty simple. Um, you can see the uh, folders. You can see doc files. You can so, upload, so is the is the is is the center around the communication as opposed to the file sharing and and all the other capabilities. So the conversation is the center of the platform. Literally, figuratively, and literally, we we design everything around the commun the chat, the communication. So, and you know, my original insight into law was that I want to be in a chat with my with my lawyers. I want to I want to see what they're doing. I want to working on so we built the chat first and then everything came on top of the chat if you share files then the file will will show is being shared in the chat if you do a an invoice a quote you log hours that all comes down into this timeline so you know it's you could think of it like like facebook like any social networking tool this is the center of the product does that answer your question it does indeed <laughs> <laughs> Those yeah, are not so, stage, by the way, I promise you. Yeah, and then and then what we also did, and this was a client who asked us, she said, what about Google Docs? So, you know, we made it possible that um, within the file system, you could just click on a Google Doc, and then, you know, this allows for lawyers and clients to work together on a doc in real time, you know, click, add a little comment, uh, this looks good. Um, you know, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel uh jump it back and you know it's, it speaks to a, a collaborative uh, agile way of working uh similarly activities the ability you know uh let's assign this one to the client you know um uh, let, so so creating tasks and, and to-do lists and saying what's the lawyer going to do what's the client's going to do um you know let's let's put a deadline on this thing um and let the client know the deadline so everyone is, is sort of working together and accountable. A lot of this is, is obviously inspired from my old life as a software developer, working in you know, big uh, distributed uh, teams that are you know, sort of separated by continents. Um, and so practicing uh, this kind of work is crucial to, to, to what we did. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, I'm sure that uh, anyone interested will, will reach out for uh, a more detailed uh, demo of the product. Um, sure, sure, sure. I, I just want to, um, if I can show you one more thing quickly, um, while we've got you, you guys on, is that we, we also have an accounting system over here. Um, and so 
when when you're when you're actually working in one of these teams so you you can work with uh, more than one lawyer at the same time so if i'm in uh, this this team over here i i've got multiple accounts going on and, and a brand new integration and uh, sort of we're showing this off to the world um at the moment is that we are adding um shield pay functionality um and what that's going to allow is it's going to allow for vi um, virtual third-party managed accounts to be part of the product and i, I know a couple of people from shield pay are, are tuned in for the webinar so i want to give them a shout out um the the idea behind shield pay is that the the lawyer and the client can hold the money at the same time see the money at the same time um and work collaboratively in that way so you know on a case-by-case -case basis um client and lawyer can chat in the discussion uh share and and move money around yeah and i awesome. think that uh, one, one one thing that actually is worth mentioning here is that in about um 10 days or to two weeks we're, we're having another webinar together with the colleagues from shoot pay and the sra um yeah we'll be sending you more information about that as as the as the details um uh, uh, come together uh, no no later than than mid next week uh, so we'll keep you guys updated. I wish to thank everyone uh, for joining us today, uh, especially Electra and, and Guy. Um, and I oh, wish you a fantastic you weekend. Up, Excuse me? Thank you for setting it up. Well, always my pleasure. Always my pleasure. Uh, I'm sure everyone's got some uh, big plans for the weekend. Enjoy them. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you very yeah. much, Alexa. Always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. You have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Too. Bye. Yeah.